Hey everybody, I'm Dick Cantwell, and this is the Brewer to Brewer podcast from All About Beer. My guest is Peter Buchart of Purpose Brewing, and he's here for a conversation that will go beyond the brew house, although we'll spend some time there too, and into topics that matter to brewing professionals and curious beer drinkers. Uh, first, please visit allaboutbeer.com and follow on social media at All About Beer. And to support journalism in the beer space, check out patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We'll get into the conversation in just a moment, but first, this message. Time to add a kick of color. Blue butterfly flower is a natural, flavorless flower that gives beers an attractive violet or amethyst hue. Contact First Tea to discover blue butterfly and other natural botanicals that deliver color, fragrance, and flavor. Email info at First Tea, that's F I R S D T E A, dot com to find out more. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, MMC's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit malteuropemaltingco.com to learn how Malt Europe can support your malting needs. Or you can contact them at customer success at malteurope.com or call 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Malt Europe, premium grains from field to flavor. Today's episode is sponsored by Stomp Stickers. Stomp is a proud member of the Brewers Association that produces a wide variety of printed brewery products, such as beer labels, keg collars, coasters, beer boxes, and much more. Stomp's website features an easy-to-use digital design tool, low-quantity orders, fast turnaround times, and free domestic shipping. Visit stompstickers.com and use code BREWER for 15% off of your first order. Okay, let's get into it. A bit about my guest today. Peter is currently brewmaster and co-owner of Purpose Brewing and Cellars in Fort Collins, Colorado, and runs Beer Bucart Consult International since 2017. He started to love beer while growing up in Belgium and went on to study brewing engineering at the U University of Ghent, Belgium. Uh, Zulte was the first brewery he worked in, one of the breweries of the group Cronenborg at that time. He went on to become brewmaster at Rodenbach for almost 10 years. He also worked with Brewery de, de Houdenboom and started his own brew pub, De Zwingel, in Hadelbeke in 1994. In 1996, he moved to the U.S. to join New Belgium Brewing, where he was brewmaster until 2017. This fast-growing, always-expanded brewery was, according to him, really a fun ride culminating in the design build and startup of the new brewery in Asheville. He gains various expertises along the way, gained, the, gained them, that is, from brewing distilling to being a Black Belt Six Sigma in quality, board member for various breweries and trade organizations, to being a small business owner on two continents. He's published on sour beers, fermentation modeling, and metabol metabolomic profiling of beer, speleology, and caves. Together with me, he wrote the book, Wood and Beer, A Brewer's Guide. Uh, Peter is also happily married to his wife, Freezy, and has two sons, Wot and Jo Wolf. Uh, with whom I had the pleasure of traveling in Europe while we were uh, working on the wood book. But that was a story I told in my last interview. So welcome, Peter. Good to talk to you. Yeah, welcome. Good to see you. <laughs> you too. Uh, it's been a while since we had you out here at the ranch, but you'll be back. Yeah, we, our son is not studying in Oregon anymore, eh? so we don't have an excuse to go out west. Right. Well... You're, you are west, but uh, farther west, yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, let's get started. Um, you know, about your, you know, looking at your bio, you know, everybody knows, you know, about your time and your accomplishments in New Belgium. And before that, that you were brewmaster at Rodenbach for quite a long time. But not everybody even knows that you ran the brew pub. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, the brew pub, that was kind of a funny one that uh, started with one of my friends caving that was running a bar and we started brewing, home brewing basically. And uh, home brewing stumbled, uh, to make the story short, into commercial brewer because we bought a 500 liter 
uh, Mash Lauderton from another brewery. And then we had to scale up all the rest. And suddenly we found a location and we had a location and we had a brewery. And so um, it was just a side activity. It was made for two couples, Frazy and I. Um, we were brewing in the weekend and uh, yeah, we were open in the weekend. But in the week I was working in Rodenbach and Frazy was working for the police. <laughs> right. So what kind of beers did you make at the brew pub? <laughs> that uh, was a very Belgium and at that time very um, doable concept just because the way we were running it. We brewed one beer uh, who was a bit of a higher alcohol version, pale beer uh, with the Rodenbach yeast. So we were we tried to do everything to reduce the impact of the lactobacilli, but still have a little bit of sour so they have enough refreshing notes in the beer. And it was a dangerous beer, basically, because you didn't taste the alcohol. So people, yeah. Did well, when, when people pointed that out to me about high alcohol beers, I always just said, well, we aim to please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that was it. We had water. If you wanted water from the the faucet, and uh, if you wanted to bring in food, well, bring in food. So it was very simple. <laughs> what does what does Zwingel mean? Zwingel. It's a term for um, basically hacking the flax because um, it's a very sturdy. I don't know the word in English. Um, um plant and you have to get the cellulose off and so it's a uh it was a rotating device that was powered by a pedaling uh, motion and so you brought in the flax and you basically cut the cellulose loose so they get to the fiber they can use that for textile or other stuff so it was a very dusty environment and so you need a lot of beer to keep that running and because you have to keep on paddling <laughs> Have you um, never seen those? Well, yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's, 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 a, it's a spinning wheel. Yeah, and it's a wooden it's a wooden um, fins on it, eh? so planks. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, anyway, I, I'd like to compare the brewing scenes in the U.S. and in Belgium a little bit. You know, in our early days, very few of us even went to brewing school. I mean, I never did. And a lot mm -hmm. of my friends sort of doubled back and did that to, to sort of give themselves some legitimacy, I think. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, and to learn about about how to make beer. Um, but so you did go to brewing school, of course, and I'm I'm guessing that in Europe the expectation was along those lines. Um, anyway, so what was the scene like? What was the expectation when you got out of brewing school? What 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 was it? What was it prescribed for for you to be doing? So um, the expectations from brewing school it, it's comes from a broad uh, engineering uh, schooling, engineering and chemistry, but then the specialization and the people that did the specialization were expected to go into brewing or malting or um, supply industry. There was somebody who started working on, uh, but the rest, do you still hear me? No, we're having a hard time with your signal again. Wow. Yeah. Although, I saw right now I can hear you. And did yeah. you hear me blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'd say just keep rolling with it then. Okay. So, yeah, it's, compared to the U.S., um, it's an older brewing country. And if you want to find a job in a, a brewery or a malt house, you're expected to have at least some kind of formation like that. But your track was always brewing, of course. Yeah. Um, I applied for malting at uh, Dingemans, and the father still remembers that. But I was in my army duty at that point. And so they're like, well, come back when you're done with your army duty. So um, you mentioned the first brewery you worked at. How long was it before you went on to Rodenbach? About first, there was a job in Kronenburg. Um, so that was more like an internship that you had to do from school out also. Um, and so how long was that? I think it was only a couple of months. So. Oh, okay. 
Well, I mean, that must have been something to to walk into Rodenbach as as you know. I mean, it's a it's a legendary brewery. I mean, I I've referred to it as basically a basilica to to making beer. Um, I mean, what was that like to go in there knowing you were going to be working there? Um, well, I knew Rodenbach, um, the facility and the beer uh, going in. So, but then. Right away, I got a job as brewmaster, and the previous brewmaster left, and so I was really thrown in there, who was a big surprise, because you know how to make beer, but you don't really know how to make Rodemba. Um But, okay, you have the skill set to, to do so, but, yeah, it was a big step for a young brewing engineer. Boy, I can imagine. How old were you when you started there? Uh, after army duty, like 23 or something. Wow. And I mean, was it was it smaller then? I mean, did production ramp up later, or was it bigger? No, well, Rodema has never been a big brewery. It's been a Belgian medium-sized brewery between sixty and eighty thousand hectoliter a year. So it's a pretty decent size, but the complexity was um, the aging in wooden barrels. Eh? So its footprint is a huge brewery. Eh? And you had studied wood techniques in brewing school? No, not at all. So you learned that on the fly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, three Coopers at that point. So we had some people there that I could rely on uh, for the physical work to be done. But then the decision making on when to do what, uh, we had certain longer term maintenance on the fooders was based on visuals and, and had to come from me again without, I had um, my boss at the time had done brewing in Leuven. Um, and so he had some experience, but was also more in upper management. Didn't really have much of the practical experience. And as I recall in that era, didn't you make, you made the three beers, the regular Rodenbach, the Grand Cru and the Alexander, is that correct? Yeah, the Alexander was relatively new at that point. It was two years old, uh, and it was a Grand Cru and um, yeah, and the classical Roden by that point. Eh? We didn't do anything of contract work at that point uh, that came in later. So shifting just a little bit, I remember a story about, uh, well, I mean, the first times I went to Dodola Browers and I tasted the, particularly the Ur beer, and I remember hearing a story that they were getting the yeast from you. And I think you've corrobor corroborated that too, the Rodenbach yeast. And I remember noticing after the palm sale that the Roden or that the uh, Didola Brower's beer no longer had that distinctive sourness to it. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether you can even talk about all that kind of stuff, but you mentioned using the yeast in your own brewery. And I know that, that their, their beer was really dependent on that flavor. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a great story, actually. And really thanks to New Belgium, who gave me the lead way to um, uh, work on that. So I think it was um, 99 or something when Baum bought Rodenbach. And shortly after that, they stopped distributing yeast. And one of the smaller ones influenced was uh, the Dollar Brouwers. Chris used uh, Rodenbach yeast for the bottle condition, sorry, the aging of um, Urbeer. And so um, I isolated some yeast from, <laughs> I think this can be all public right now. Um, there was a bottle uh, brewery that bottle conditioned beer with Rodenbach yeast at that point, and it was uh, the Ranke, Holden, what's the their beer? Uh, the triple? <laughs> The double X or triple, whatever. No, no, no. It's their, their triple. Was at oh, that yeah. point made with a uh, Rodenbach yeast. So I isolated that, grew that up in just regular fermentation because otherwise you create a selective process for lactobacillus mm -hmm. versus yeast. Um, and we started brewing at a, a small brew pub in uh, Boulder, the Red Fish, so that we could send slurry of yeast to Chris. So in the meantime, I worked with Chris, sorry, Chris is uh, Chris Hertleer from the Dolle Brouwers. Uh, in the meantime, Chris, um, I had been talking with him and with somebody who was working with him on the yeast who came from the bakery sector. 
Um, and so he bought one of my old fermenters from my brew pub in uh, Belgium. And we used that to do a lactic um, culture uh, post brewing. So in hopped words, basically urbier, hopped strong word. And we just kept that on uh, the Rodenbach yeast so that we were able to maintain lactobacilli. The story goes over a couple of years, of course, eh? but that's kind of how the outcome was. <laughs> right. Well, I remember writing about it, you know, then at that point, all, all this was just rumored. And I, you and I had not yet even met. And I kept hearing about this crazy brewer at Rodenbach and all that kind of stuff who was supplying <laughs> the yeast. And, and then thankfully we met. Um, yeah. So skipping ahead to, to, to your, your entry to New Belgium, you know, I've always given Jeff, uh, Jeff Liebisch, a, a lot of credit for, you know, he, he started the brewery, he grew it, and he got to a certain point at which he recognized that it was probably a good idea to bring a trained brewmaster on to, uh, to uh, take it to the, next, uh, to the next level, as they say. And, and that was you. But, you know, I've heard, I've heard Kim's version of the story about how, how you guys met and, you know, that eventually, you know, she sort of, uh, you know, nervously mentioned that they were looking for a brewmaster. I'd like to hear your version of it. How did all that happen? <laughs> That's a, I, mean, I can only give my perspective as you have had uh, um, your perspective from Kim. Uh, for us, uh, I came out to Boston to the Craft Brewers Conference, who was still a very small occasion at that point. What I didn't know was that New Belgium had paid for my flights because the Brewers Association or uh, the BOA, as it was called at that point, um, had invited me and uh, paid for the flight and the hotel and um, asked to do a lecture about uh, sour beers. Um, after that, uh, there were some questions and the long the line was too long at the end. And Kim and Jeff were the last ones and they invited me, me and Frizi, uh for dinner. And so we went to dinner and uh, that's where Kim suddenly threw out that they were looking for a Belgian brewer who was for us a surprise question. And... Um, also, for me, it didn't look even as a feasibility. I never considered uh, living in the U.S. Um, we both had a regular job, plus we were running our small brewery in the weekend and at night. Um, so I'm like, yeah, good luck, was my answer. Um, but then we stayed with Daryl Goss, who was the brewmaster in uh, Cambridge Brewing at that point. And he asked us about, do you know where Colorado is? Do you know this brewery, New Belgium? It's kind of an up and coming brewery. Why don't you consider it? You're in vacation. So he really pushed us to um, maybe give it a try, even if you don't really think about it, just give it a try. Um, and so we drove out to Colorado and uh, the rest is history basically. Well, I love the story about you guys saying, you know, that you would drive out, you know, the normal, <laughs> the more normal thing to do, of course, would be to fly to take a look. But, but you guys, I mean, did you, you, you must have had an idea of how far it was, but you know, the U.S. is bigger than Belgium. So how, how, how was that trip? Uh, the trip was interesting. We looked at flying, but the flight price was more expensive than the flight from Belgium to Boston uh, because it was basically the next day. And so that's how we decided to drive. We had some realization that the U.S. was bigger, but we didn't know that was that big. <laughs> the drive was actually fun. We initially took it very at ease with um, uh, hanging out the first night at a home brewer, I think, in Massachusetts somewhere we were he had a whole basement full of barrels and we drank way too much and then we went to Toronto I think and to Niagara Falls and Niagara Falls was like oh shit we better start driving <laughs> so I mean what did you what went through your mind when you when you walked into New Belgium and saw what they were up to yeah, that was an incredible experience. Uh, first, we had seen mountains because we drove from Denver to Fort Collins. And if you grow up in Belgium, you know there's mountains here. And there were snow-covered mountains, fantastic view. And then we stopped uh, in uh, New Belgium and 
Pau was a big broody, not big compared to Rodenbach, just uh, on the physical side. But they just had moved into the new facility that's still the current facility on 500 Linden and had done an incredible job on building out a brewery on limited resources. And so had to cut some corners on different things and on the size of the building had to be reduced with 10% at a certain point because it was too big. And then everywhere, and Jeff was doing the programming of uh, the brew house because they couldn't afford and they couldn't afford PLCs that were commercial PLCs. It was a crazy place for me as a experienced Belgian brewer to walk in and I'm like, what the heck did those guys do here? <laughs> and you know, I, as we all know, you know, Jeff had uh, been inspired by Belgian beers. And had uh, you know come up with uh, or synthesized some some his his version of some Belgian styles and all that stuff. I mean, what 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 was your reaction to the beers? The beers was fantastic. I, um, I was not expecting something like an amber ale, who was at that point one of the biggest specialty beers segments in Belgium, uh, to be such a great beer and uh, it was funky because it was dry hopped who was kind of odd for and no amber beers in belgium are dry hopped but then there was a triple a double um there was a fruit beer but the fruit beer was maybe the most surprising and the old cherry was actually a malty beer with cherry um second uh, where in belgium at that point the cherry beers were cherry and then there was Sunshine Meat, who was the wedding beer from Kim and Jeff, who was high in coriander, but a fantastic beer also. It was really a great example to see what was happening there. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to ask you if you brought yeast with you to New Belgium, but you certainly brought an awareness of all the, uh, you know, all the experience you had at Rodenbach. Um, you know, and over the years, you developed, you know, the biggest wood program in the U.S. at New Belgium. I mean, how did how did that get them? I mean, we know something about how that all got started, but how did it, how, how did that, how did that grow? Grow. OK, if I, if I grow, it grew a bit by um, as we were doing things at that point in New Belgium and nine barrels became 12 barrels and 12 barrels became a truckload of barrels around 100 barrels. And then I started, uh, me and Robert Poland, who now runs a cheese uh, maker here in Fort Collins, um, started looking and we bought some footage of 60 hectoliters, if I remember or, right. And uh, it was at that point that Kim was like, what are you doing? And like, are you going to start selling this beer? And it was like, oh, selling. Hmm. And so I'm like, yeah, we could sell some of that beer. And so the first La Folie that we made um, was a blend of the smaller barrels because that's what we had. But we only made, don't remember exactly, but the batch size became around 20 hectoliters, so like 18 hectoliters at that point. We probably did less the first time. 20 hectoliters, wow. Yeah, and you know that time, Dick, a, a sour beer was like, and especially maybe Colorado was still a backwater, was English and German styles. Um, nobody had a clue about Belgian beers and that sour as a flavor in beer was like, what are you guys thinking? And it was completely strange for the customer because we were only in a couple of states by that point. Eh? Right. Well, Kim tells the story of her office being up the stairs from the tasting room there at the brewery and hearing people sometimes tasting La Folie and, and hearing their, rea their, their unvarnished reactions to it. You know, some people, of course, were saying this is incredible and other people were going, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I couldn't understand that. I, uh, growing up uh, with drinking Rodenbach from when I was 13, I, I, growing up with sour beer, like I didn't even realize that sour was not part of the flavor spectrum of a beer in the, in the U.S. or in Colorado. I don't know how I have to phrase that. Well, at least not intentionally. Well, look, before, <laughs> we, get in, before we get into some of your other projects at New Belgium, maybe we should take a short break. 
Blue butterfly flower has been used for centuries in Southeast Asian cultures to add bright blues, pinks, and purples to foods and teas. Now brewers and distillers have joined in, using this flavorless flower to infuse new colors into familiar drinks. Ready to make your brews pop with fresh color? Talk with the team at First Tea, and they'll help you find the best way to use blue butterfly and other teas for your next project. Email info at firsttea.com. That's F-I-R-S-D-T-E-A dot com. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, MMC's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit MaltEuropeMaltingCo.com to learn how Malt Europe can support your malting needs. Or you can contact them at customer success at MaltEurope.com or call 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Malt Europe, premium grains from field to flavor. This episode is also sponsored by Stomp Stickers, one of our favorite partners when it comes to printed brewery products. Stomp Stickers is a reliable resource for printed items such as beer labels and boxes, keg collars, coasters, and more. Visit stompstickers.com and use code BREWER for 15% off of your first order. And that's the break. So at New Belgium, you, we've talked a little bit about how you developed the sour program, the wood program. I mean, what else did you, I mean, I remember some wonderful beers from those years. I mean, maybe some of your favorites. I mean, I remember the Beer de Mars was incredible. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, my whole life in New Belgium was always about growth. And so it was always hurting somewhere and it was working with and around the bottleneck who was in my eyes um, an incredible and lovely experience as a brewmaster. You have to yeah, dance with your system the whole time because you get challenged on water supply, on uh, mash capacity, on water capacity, on, on kettle time, on, on fermentation time, on uh, for dry hopping. <laughs> and it kept on going, eh? name it, and I had to deal with it. And the beer developing part is was a kind of the fun part of it. You, oh, no, I kind of loved the bottleneck resolution also. Um, but the beer uh, developing uh, was initially relatively slow. We started with seasonals, uh, so or we didn't call them seasonals. We called them something else. I forget now. Um, but we did four a year from the moment I started, and some of them became year por- a yearly portfolio then or not. Um, and that development went faster and faster, of course, as the end, as the world around us was changing. Um, from that development, and there's of course some jewels in there. Uh, I really like the La Folie because it started completely spontaneous. Uh, Robert, not spontaneous fermented, but spontaneous as an initiative. Uh, with Robert Pollen and I just started to goof off and kept on going and didn't really ask for permission, uh, didn't even ask for forgiveness along the way. We just went. Um, the Blue Paddle for me is one of the beers that uh, was a complete, so that was a lager that we wanted to create a Pilsner. Um, but the brewery was absolutely not set up for it. We couldn't cool um, in summer, the word. We just had water cooling and the water gets pretty warm in summer here. Um, in, and we didn't really have aging capacity. We didn't have tank time. Uh, so I had to develop the beer with the means that we had and um, the brewery and never really have developed a beer like this was for me a fantastic occasion. And I'm also very proud about what became of it. Beer de Mars, uh, if there's three ingredients in beers, knowledge, experience, and creativity, um, experience and knowledge was really fa- uh, Blue Paddle, uh, where um, the Beer de Mars was a beer that relied almost 100% on creativity. And 
and relying on a beer ingredient for 100% is kind of nuts eh? and makes you push your self uh, in your mind and in your capabilities in a whole different direction than uh, just being working in a knowledge field. Eh? So, yeah, for me, there, there were quite a bit of different items. In the, also, the, in the meantime, the brewery was developing very fast. And we, we kept on bringing more and more people. I think we hired really good people, and New Belgium still retains quite a bit of those great people. And those great people brought stuff with them in fields that were where that, wherever, and because we were growing company and we needed expertise in all kinds of fields and it was fantastic on the people that we brought in and the skill level that we brought in and then specific to the beer side the creativity level that we brought in and so it was an incredible ride is how i put it in my um bio because it was an incredible ride on so many aspects well, one other aspect too that, and I remember the very one, the, when when New Belgium and Elysian started working together. I remember you kind of put me on the spot. You know, you said, "What is your culture?" You know, you mm -hmm. wanted to get to know what our culture was, and you know, honestly, I, I don't think we've thought about it sufficiently. And I've had more to say about that, but this is my, your interview, not mine. Um, but you know, New Belgium always had a very well developed and very, I mean, it was just, the place was permeated with the culture. It was, it was held by everybody. I mean, I, you should talk about that, not me. Yeah. I mean, this is an incredible, how are that? I'm looking for words, an incredible experience um, I had. I moved to the U.S. and I thought the U.S. this is going to be and people don't get vacation. People are working um, day and night and they are not focusing on life. And then you arrive in New Belgium and the seeds were planted from the beginning. And a key person within that is, of course, Kim Jordan, that you know pretty well. Um, she at any given point was always the keeper of the culture. And at a certain point, she was my boss. She was not always my boss. And so a lot of the feedback she gave was quite vague, but she just gave tidbits on, well, just think about this and this. And it could be metamorphic on the subject that we were talking about, or it could be, but it really was cultural inspired things. If you look at New Belgium, it became kind of as a, you almost forget until now you, you live on the other side and you see um, uh, how breweries, especially currently in the US, are having a thin margin and are trying to squeeze by with whatever they can. But if you can work on culture uh, and keep it the core of you, you get so much more back from whoever works within it. Uh, it was really a huge surprise for me. And we had already implemented open book management before I started. And we didn't even have employee ownership, but we talked about the financials. Um, there were incentives that all the incentives were also always created to fit the culture. Hey, an incentive like after a year, just you get a bike, a cruiser bike, because we we're wearing four cons and it was flat. Um, in anything that this company was doing, it was just an incredible company. And you need to, in a leadership position, you basically ask the same questions to your employees that work for you. Hey, so what would be the best for New Belgium? What would be the best for who we are? Or questions that you ask if you talk about technical subject, if some pump in the dry hopping process needs to be replaced or something, or the new process that needs to be developed or beer needs to be developed. And so it's inspired everything within it. Right. I mean, culture by its very definition, you know, is influence on other things that then are imprinted and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, this is a bit different, but I also think it's interesting how, um, 
you know, here we are talking about you bringing aspects of Belgian brewing culture to the U.S. to to bring into existence at New Belgium. And then, of course, you know, U.S. breweries started influencing other breweries around the world, including Belgium. I mean, I think it's fascinating mm -hmm. to, to to watch that game go back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, but the, the cultural aspect, I think, within corporate America and beyond um, is a, something that is not very well developed in most companies. It was incredible developed in New Belgium. And I think the the keeper of the culture was Kim Jordan. You don't have to wind around it. So in 2017, you left New Belgium. Mm -hmm. And uh, you started Purpose. Well, what was your mission going into Purpose? <laughs> um, I just had a had an incredible experience in New Belgium, and I was um, finding a location, um, getting to the process of uh, permissions, building, and uh, starting up a brewery in Nashville. And then we hired such a great crew there, and. Um, it felt so much like New Belgium in 96 there at that point. So for me, we we suddenly had great people there. And so, well, they didn't need me on a daily basis anymore. So I had to reflect on where do I go next? What do I do next in, in New Belgium? And so I took my sabbatical, one of those other incentives that New Belgium was offering. I took my second sabbatical after... 21 years, I guess. Um, and um, I looked around. I made sure, I drove west, basically. Um, and I made sure that every evening I was uh, staying at somebody or close by a brewery or, or somebody in the industry. And I had conversation all the time and every night over beer. And I was so amazed about the beauty that um, was there in American brewing. And I started questioning myself, like, hey, how can I add to this beauty? And then I was like, if I have to do it from within New Belgium, it's going to be hard, like, or I have to develop a whole new position. And my title always was brewmaster there. But literally, my my job changed always all the time, and so I was like, okay, what can I do within New Belgium? And I'm like, oh, if I have to follow my passion, I have to go back to brewing. And I need to start maybe something small, and and where I can run a small company, brew on my own, make whatever I want, and just play around. And so I started developing that idea and bouncing it off on people, and. It felt just the right thing to do. It was time for me to start again, like I've done before, and add to the beauty in American brewing. What was the first beer you made at Purpose? It was actually Beer de Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we brewed some other beers. So we brewed initially for barrels because we wanted to have a sour beer program but we're just a brew pub, so it didn't have to be too big. So initially we brewed different recipes for barrels. We did double brews, filled barrels um, until we were around 80 barrels. And at that point, we started looking at brewing beer that we could sell direct. So Beer de Mars uh, was one of them. Second was Nacht. And I'm just looking at brewing it here again this weekend. Um it's a dark beer with four different spices, um, very subtle, like a chef would make a beer, basically. Well, this is maybe a, a difficult concept, but I remember um, Kim telling me a story about you seeing a piece of, you know, polished wood that Victor, in something that Victor Horta had designed. And your reaction to that was that you wanted to brew a beer that, that was like that that golden wood that you saw. I mean, this strikes me as some sort of a, a sort of a synesthesia. You know, like Kim's younger son Nick, when he hears numbers, he thinks of colors. 
And when you see a piece of wood, you think about beer. Yeah, I I don't know if it's my Belgian roots or maybe not. I don't know, but in Jeff always said, hey, "We're only creating ten minutes of pleasure," and so for me, that concept is like, "Hey, you." you're just going to make something that's going to wow your customer, but it's only 10 minutes of pleasure. So it's only 10 minutes. They are going to go, they're going to taste, they're going to judge. They're going to talk a little bit about it. And then they're going to go on with their life. They're going to talk with their friends. And, and so you're just a social lubricant as a brewer. So you have to think about your art as, um, as yeah, it's a form of art that is very consumable. <laughs> um, and so for me, um, nowadays, um, I, I'm talking more with chefs because they're the closest to what we are creating. And they also create something consumable. But anything in art or in in what you see, how you wake up, um, how you walk, the dog, um, inspires you. And so how will you convey those 10 minutes of pleasure you have there in whatever you are doing um, into my art making beer and so that's why i'm very open on on looking at whatever comes to you and and be open-minded on trying to capture the moment i did a bike ride of 100 kilometers mostly downhill uh, two days ago. And wow, there's a beer there. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with taking inspiration from absolutely everywhere. And you mentioned chefs, you know, cooking as inspiration is, is kind of obvious too. I remember offhand a beer you made at one point that was inspired by Pan de Tomate. You, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 I mean, how did you touch on that? How did you execute that? Yeah, panatomaque is in Spain when you have to wait too long on your food. Sometimes they bring up just some bread and they rub in some garlic and then some tomato. And uh, you get some olive oil, some salt, some pepper, some... Um, yeah, and it's very simple as something that they offer you. And it's an absolute 10 minutes of pleasure. And so I had to make beer of that. Uh, uh, tomatoes in beer are kind of weird. So how are you going to approach that? Garlic, Ooh, that's a tough one. But he, how are you going to take this as something that's beautiful, tasteful, your 10 minutes of pleasure and translate it into something uh, that can be 10 minutes of pleasure for your customers? So I had to do it. Um it's just one of those moments it happens and you're like, wow, this is it. And I came back here in purpose. I'm like, I'm going to make a tomato beer. And they look at me like, what? And I don't know. We'll, we'll see later. And but yeah, you get the picture. Um, <laughs> and there's so many fantastic chefs. Their background is is different in cooking, but we have a longer process than they have uh, to do, to modify flavors in a, a reduction process of the yeast or in a boiling process in the brew house or um, uh, change. Yeah, there's so much more opportunities. We can do way better paintings than any chef can do. We just don't think about it. Another one I remember um, was a beer that I remember you were inspired by uh, a beer that Danny made at Phantom with the, with spinach that was brilliant green. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you know Danny of Phantom, if you want to buy a brewery, it's for sale right now. So <laughs> <laughs> Danny is a, doesn't drink beer and he makes uh, goofy beers and uh, often there's a jewel in there. And one of those jewels was a, a beer he just tapped and he had to make a beer to, with green tea for Japan. And he thought it was not green enough. And so he said, I just dry hopped it with spinach. I'm like, wow, you dry hopped it with spinach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And so I'm like, oh shit, I have to do this. I have to make a beer with spinach. And Danny being Danny, he never tells you everything, you know, maybe like Belgian brewers, they don't tell you everything. And so I had to figure it out, but okay, I can figure it out. And so we made it a cake for that group that there was a trip from New Belgium, a certain trip on their five year trip. So we made every year one keg of spinach beer for them and we served it in a pub in, uh, in Fort Collins when they came over. Yep, I remember it. I had it. It was, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it reminds me of the pumpkin malt liquor I made that I dyed orange. But that, once again, we're not talking about my stuff. Um, <laughs> one other thing that, that I know I've really enjoyed, and I think you have too, is, is judging. You know, I've I've all I've learned so much judging um, and, you know, you and I these days have, you know, the freedom to go around the world and judge here and there. Uh, I know I know I, I, I know you love doing that. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you want to talk a little bit about that? I'm wondering which scenes, which which brewing scenes around the world do you think are particularly interesting these days? Yeah, that's a good one. I'm happy you phrased the end, uh, the question like that at the end. Um, uh, the wind is blowing a bit in our nose here in, in the US. It's the second time. It's a bit harder than we've used to. And so we see a lot of younger kids in brewing in the US um, complaining a lot. Um, well, welcome to business. Um, you're working in a great business. Uh, yes, it gets sometimes tough. Um, get through it, man. Uh, man up and and do it. And so, what I've been inspired by is um, other places in the world. So I'm thinking mainly about Central to South America. Um, but we recently, Frizi and I were recently in South Africa also, um, and you see that young enthusiasm, that young enthusiasm that you, Dick, and I uh, both experienced as a big and great part of our life. Um, you see that young enthusiasm there. And that enthusiasm is just bringing you back. It, it it's, it's works on you. It bites you. It never lets you lose. And we need, we can't forget that, that it's brewing, you know? We don't have to make IPAs all the time because our customers is going to ask for IPAs because they don't know anything else anymore to ask for than IPAs. But there's so much more beauty to do. But it's us with our passion and our blah, blah, blah that we're going to do around the beer that is going to create their experience and create how they are going to shift in what they're going to drink next. Especially in a small place like here, you can just talk people into whatever beer. They come in and ask for a light beer and they end up drinking sours. But you just convey your enthusiasm and they drink your enthusiasm. We are in an industry like this. If we start to become boring, uh, bored um, entrepreneurs, uh, so will our customers be. And so for me, I'm being so happy to find that back in other countries right now, to find that young enthusiasm. And we should never forget this as uh, a mature craft brewing industry as we are in the US right now. But we're just making beer. We're just making 10 minutes of pleasure. Wow, your customer. Yeah, I agree. I've, I've always had to, I've had to remind people at times that we're making beer. All, all we do is make beer. You know, the whole cult of fame that sometimes gets attached to certain brewers. It's like, all we do is make beer. It's not that big a deal. We love what we do and we're proud of it, but we just make beer. Um, well, where in particular do you, I mean, I've, I've, I've always thought that Brazil had really interesting things going on with, with the ingredients they have. I mean, where else do you think You've you had some things that just blew knocked your socks off. Well, and Dick, you, we need to join each other in uh, in Ecuador. Uh, the, I brought some spices back for the second time from a chicha, a barrel aged chicha in Ecuador, uh, from Kitenia Brewing. Um, incredible, incredible! Like chicha got poo pooed upon by the big brewers in those countries. 
and because of that has that reputation here also and in basically the rest of the world. But think about it. You have an opportunity um, working with something that has been around for longer than any Belgian beer has been around or any German beer has been around. Um, and then they make out of a simple alcoholic drink a piece of beauty with barrel aging, with spicing, uh, with a tea-like substance that is actually common to that country. Uh, but they do something beautiful with an old tradition, an old tradition that outdates pretty much anything that exists in England or wherever. And uh, where, where, where am I going with that? And this is, again, some of those inspirations that you bring back. I bet I, I have a bottle in my fridge. You just have to bring the camper, camper over here. Okay. Well, we'll do that. Well, you also need to come visit us, and we need to make a beer here on my barn system. It's on my to-do system. <laughs> to -do All right. <laughs> Good. And actually, I've got some, I mean, just so we can start thinking about it, I've got a couple of, I've got some Palo Santo, and I've got a bunch of Amburana in case we want to do something with wood. That's that's one of my regrets, that we that we didn't know more about some of the South American woods when we wrote the beer, wrote the wood book. Yeah, but you've written more books than I do, and you always have specialist and that uh, approach you after the fact uh, after you've written the book and you're like wow this is a golden nugget uh, like uh, there's so many golden people out there in any field that yeah there's just so much beauty out there <laughs> there certainly is well that seems like a good place for us to sort of wrap things up i guess i mean it's been really really wonderful talking to you um and I appreciate your taking the time and I'm, I look forward to seeing who you interview. So, and you know, with that in mind, Peter will be back on the next episode, uh, having a conversation with a brewer of his choosing. Um, and that'll be on the air in about two weeks, something like that. So make sure you tune in for that. Um, just one more reminder about sponsorship here. Uh, visit allaboutbeer.com and follow it on social media. And to support journalism in the beer space, check out patreon.com slash all about beer um i'm dick cantwell once again and thank you very much for listening to brewer to brewer podcast and peter thank you so much first tea is a proud sponsor of the brewer to brewer podcast first tea invites you to explore the rich and versatile world of teas and botanicals including blue butterfly flower Email info at firsttea.com to find out more. That's F-I-R-S-D-T-E-A dot com. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, MMC's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit malteuropemaltingco.com to learn how Malt Europe can support your malting needs. Or you can contact them at customer success at malteurope.com or call 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Malt Europe, premium grains from field to flavor. Today's episode was also sponsored by our friends at Stomp Stickers. Stomp is a proud member of the Brewers Association that produces a wide variety of printed brewery products, such as beer labels, keg collars, coasters, beer boxes, and much more. Stomp's website features an easy-to-use design tool, low quantity orders, fast turnaround times, and free domestic shipping. Visit stompstickers.com and use code BREWER for 15% off of your first order.